Good morning and welcome to our business update conference call. I'm Arnold Donald, President and CEO of Carnival Corporation and PLC. I'm joined today telephonically by our chairman, Mickey Arison, who is in Europe, and here with me in Miami, David Bernstein, our Chief Financial Officer, Beth Roberts, Senior Vice President of Investor Relations, and as part of our previously announced transition, our Chief Operations Officer, Josh Weinstein. Thank you all for joining us this morning. Now, before I begin, please note that some of our remarks on this call will be forward-looking. Therefore, I must refer you to the cautionary statement in today's press release. This is my final business update as CEO. While very disappointingly, our share price unfortunately reflects the current market conditions, I am nonetheless very proud of all that the team has accomplished over the last nine years. I am especially proud of how well we have collectively overcome what seemed like insurmountable obstacles at times these last few years. And I remain very excited about our future. With cash from operations now turning positive, we have reached an inflection point and, in fact, turned the corner and are headed on a positive trajectory. I am not only excited about, I am also very confident in the future of our company, and I'm looking forward to its continued success. I strongly believe in this team, and we are enjoying a smooth transition. As vice chairman, far and away, my number one responsibility will be to support Josh and his management team as they work to build on the current momentum. Josh is a proven executive. He is well-respected throughout the company. He served in key leadership roles. He's driven strong business results during his tenure, and he played an integral part in stewarding the company through the global pandemic. Josh's thorough understanding of our industry, of our operations, and our business strategy puts him in a strong position to lead the next phase of our company's journey. With his vision, intensity, and core values truly aligned with those that characterize our company, I cannot think of anyone better suited for this role than Josh. Now, turning to our business results. It is reinforcing to see the continued strength and demand for crews. We are aggressively, yet thoughtfully, ramping up to full operations with over 90% of the fleet now in service. And at the same time, we are driving occupancy higher on those ships that have been sailing, and we are focused on improving pricing compared to pre-COVID levels. As we had indicated for the 20 ships that restarted over the last quarter, occupancy had been intentionally constrained. That said, occupancy increased from 54% last quarter to 69% this quarter while we also increased available capacity by 25%. Now, the combination drove in over 60% sequential improvement in passengers carried. In fact, we carried over 1.6 million guests this past quarter. And partly in the month of June, we are already approaching 80% occupancy, and again, on even higher capacity. Now, what makes that even more impressive is we were able to achieve that in an environment of uncertainty given frequently changing protocols, including those that were far more restrictive than those in broader society and that were far more restrictive than those found even in other portions of the travel and leisure sector. While thankfully vaccination and test requirements are starting to relax, given the improvement in the state of the virus, we continue nonetheless to face constraints in the pool of potential guests due to ongoing requirements in a number of places. Yet, we have been able to make very meaningful progress. As you know, the CDC recently lifted the testing requirements for reentry into the U.S. for air travel, which going forward clearly removes some of the friction from our North American brand's deployment in both Europe and due to Canadian embarkations, Alaska usually requiring a longer duration flight. These itineraries are typically associated with longer lead times. Consequently, we expect the real benefit to be realized in 
2023 and beyond. Importantly, customer deposits increased by $1.4 billion in our second quarter, topping $5 billion. Now we have seen a continued increase in express demand, and we expect to see that demand continue to build as protocols are further relaxed and as society becomes increasingly comfortable managing the virus. Concerning the threat of global recession, while not recession-proof, our business has proven to be recession-resilient time and again. As we have seen in prior cycles, even in downturns, employed people take vacations. And that's even more true in today's environment, where people prioritize spending on experiences over spending on things. Cruise remains an especially appealing vacation option during downturns because of its compelling value proposition relative to land-based alternatives. Also, there is pent-up demand for travel globally, which is a powerful tailwind. Currently, we are seeing success for close-to-home cruises, with many sailings achieving occupancy at or above 100%, where guests perceive far less friction than with international embarkations. In fact, our Carnival Cruise Line brand, sailing its entire fleet, is expected to reach nearly 110% occupancy during our third quarter. We also saw an improvement in new to cruise guests in the second quarter, and we have begun to ramp up our advertising efforts selectively to help support attracting first-time cruisers. Concerning pricing, we remain focused on improving price through next year. We are focused on optimizing the occupancy while preserving long-term pricing. In this current environment of travel restrictions and health protocols, where we have close-in availability, we use opaque channels and limited promotions to capitalize on near-term demand. We are building on our aggressive fleet optimization efforts. Given challenges in parts of Europe, we have reallocated capacity to capitalize on markets where there is stronger demand. In fact, we just announced an especially creative approach that we think holds great promise, the launch of Costa by Carnival. With Costa by Carnival, we bring the ambiance and beauty of Italy to Carnival Cruise Line guests. Costa Venezia, Costa Firenze, both newly introduced and both spectacular, will be managed by Carnival Cruise Line, catering to Carnival's guest base beginning in the spring of 23 and 2024, respectively. This new concept will offer a unique experience for Carnival guests to choose fun Italian style while capitalizing on Costa's beautiful Italian designed elements. Deployment for Venezia will be announced shortly and will represent a new itinerary option for Carnival guests. Separately, we also announced the transfer of Casa Luminosa to the Carnival brand beginning in November 2022, catering to Australian guests. Now, with these changes, the Carnival brand will replenish capacity that have been removed from recent ship exits and contribute to managed growth for the brand. These new and differentiated product offerings enable us to capitalize on demand among Carnival Cruise Line guests and strengthen return on invested capital across our portfolio. In addition, we continue to further optimize our fleet and have announced the remove of an additional smaller, less efficient ship, bringing the total to 23 ships to be removed from the fleet since 2019. The accelerated removal of these less efficient ships, coupled with the delivery of nine larger, more efficient ships delivered since 2019, fosters higher revenues over time through a seven percentage point increase in the mix of premium price balcony cabins and an even better platform for onboard revenue opportunities, as well as generating a 6% reduction in ship level unit costs, excluding fuel, moderating the effects of inflation and enabling us to deliver more revenue to the bottom line. Upon returning to full operations, nearly a quarter of our capacity will consist of newly delivered ships, expediting our return to profitability and improving our return on invested capital. Moreover, next year, our capacity growth compared to 2019 
is concentrated in brands with our highest returns. Concerning recent fuel prices, we continue to aggressively manage our fuel consumption. Upon reaching full fleet operations, we anticipate that we will achieve a further 10% reduction in unit fuel consumption and 9% reduction in carbon intensity as compared to 2019. With our proactive efforts to reduce fuel consumption, we actually peaked our carbon footprint in 2011, and that's despite an over 30% increase in capacity expected through 2023. In fact, we have reaffirmed and strengthened our carbon intensity reduction goals for 2030 and are on an accelerated path to achieve them through our fleet optimization efforts, investing in projects that drive energy efficiency, designing energy efficient itineraries, and investing in port and destination projects. During the quarter, Carnival Cruise Line broke ground on an exciting new destination project, Carnival Grand Bahama Cruise Port. This destination is expected to open in late 2024 and will offer guests a uniquely Bahamian experience with many exciting features and amenities. Now, this private guest experience destination will join Princess Key, Half Moon Key, Grand Turk, Mahogany Bay, Amber Cove, and Cozumel, securing our strong foothold in the Caribbean. In fact, we benefit from a total of nine owned or operated private destinations and port facilities, including terminals in Santa Cruz at Tenerife and Barcelona. Again, I believe we have operationally reached an inflection point and we are heading in the right direction with cash from operations turning positive this quarter. We have a strong liquidity position of $7.5 billion and have already managed our debt maturity towers down through 2024. We have 91% of the fleet now operating and at improving occupancy levels, which bodes well for future cash generation. And while to date travelers perceived uncertainty and friction continues to be a headwind as protocols become less restrictive and society continues to become increasingly more comfortable managing the virus, we expect to see demand continue to build, as we have already seen with the strength for Carnival Cruise Lines closer to home cruises. The attractive value proposition relative to land-based alternatives, which is even greater today, and the continued strength in onboard revenues should help foster a good environment for pricing and should help to accelerate our momentum going forward. Once again, I don't have the words to adequately convey how personally rewarding and inspiring the commitment, the dedication, the creative ingenuity, and the phenomenal execution of our Carnival team shipboard and shoreside around the world has been. And that, of course, includes our Chairman Mickey Harrison and the rest of our Board of Directors. You know, in the face of constantly changing barriers and constraints, in an environment of continuous and extreme uncertainty, our global team of tens of thousands successfully tackled challenge after challenge after challenge, honoring our commitment to our highest priority of compliance, environmental protection, and the health, safety, and well-being of everyone, while stewarding the shareholders' assets, and positioning us for great success over time. I simply can't thank them enough, and it's truly a privilege and an honor to work with them. Thank you also to our valued guests, their loyalty to our nine world-leading brands, and the countless letters and calls of support are so deeply appreciated. Thank you to our travel agent partners, who are more critical than ever and helping to deliver the great story of our cruise. Thank you to our home port and destination communities who have stood by us throughout these challenges, among other contributions, providing vaccines and lobbying for workable protocols. Thank you to our suppliers and other many stakeholders who stood by us and worked hard to meet our needs while facing challenges of their own and, of course, of course, Thank you to our shareholders, 
our bondholders, the banks, the export credit agencies, for continued confidence in us and for ongoing support. We are indeed poised for a great future because of the efforts and contributions of so many. With that, I would like to take the opportunity to introduce Josh and give him the chance to say a few words before turning the call back to David. Josh? Thank you, Arnold. And thanks again to Mickey and the entire board of directors for this great opportunity. I strongly believe in our company and our ability to create happiness by delivering unforgettable and much needed vacations for our guests. This need is even more important in the current environment given the stresses of the past two years and the value that we all place on shared experiences with friends and family. Now, we are uniquely placed to deliver on this through our nine leading cruise brands, each with a focus on meeting their specific guests' needs and wants. We plan on renewing our efforts to ensure each brand achieves clarity of positioning and effectively reaches their target audience. This, alongside providing cruise experiences that really resonate with their distinct guest base, will help each brand optimize its yield and growth aspirations to drive revenue. We also expect to capitalize on our revitalized fleet, our continued portfolio optimization efforts, and our unparalleled destination footprint, particularly in the Caribbean and Alaska. In addition, we have an exciting sustainability roadmap that underlies all of our efforts. What also gives me tremendous confidence is our determined and resilient team around the world. They've proven time and time again for the last two and a half years that they can absolutely achieve anything. And they do it while staying true to Carnival Corporation's collective values and positive culture. All of this will help us accelerate revenues and returns, drive durable earnings growth, and improve the balance sheet. As you said, Arnold, we are clearly at an inflection point and have a bright future ahead. I'm looking forward to putting the perspectives I've gained here in my 20 years and multiple roles to work for the benefit of our shareholders and our many other stakeholders. Thanks, Josh. We're looking forward to your leadership. David? Thank you, Arnold. I'll start today with a review of guest cruise operations, along with a summary of our second quarter cash flow. Next, I will touch on our 2024 mandatory order to rotation. Then I'll provide an update on booking trends and finish up with adjusted EBITDA expectations and our current financial position. Turning to guest cruise operations, during the second quarter 2022, we restarted 20 additional ships, resulting in 74% of our total fleet capacity in guest cruise operations for the whole of the second quarter. This was a substantial increase from 60% during the first quarter 2022. As of today, 91% of our fleet capacity is in guest cruise operations. We were pleased to see that the second quarter 2022 revenue increased by nearly 50% compared to first quarter 2022, reflecting continued sequential improvement. For the second quarter, occupancy was 69% across the ships in service, a significant increase from the 54% in the first quarter. We were encouraged by the very close in demand we experienced during the second quarter for the second quarter, resulting in nearly double the close in occupancy gain in second quarter 2022 versus second quarter 2019, a trend we had anticipated. Revenue per passenger day for the second quarter 2022 decreased slightly from a strong 2019. As Arnold indicated, we are focused on optimizing occupancy while preserving long-term pricing. However, let's not forget the impact due to the future cruise credits, or FCCs as they are more commonly called, 
which costs us a couple of percentage points in second quarter 2022 versus second quarter 2019. Excluding the impact of FCC's revenue per passenger cruise day for the second quarter would have been higher than a strong 2019. Once again, our onboard and other revenue per diems were up significantly in the second quarter 2022 versus second quarter 2019, in part due to the bundled packages as well as onboard credits utilized by guests from cruises canceled during the pause. We have recently expanded our bundled package offerings given their popularity. The new bundled offerings require us to make changes to the accounting allocations. As a result, in the third quarter, you will see more of the revenue left in ticket and less allocated to onboard, impacting the onboard and other revenue per PCD comparisons for the third quarter as compared to the second quarter. Just another reason to add to the list of reasons why the best way to judge our performance is by reference to our total cruise revenue metrics. On the cost side, our adjusted cruise costs without fuel per available lower birthday, or ALBD as it is more commonly called, for the second quarter 2022 was up 23% versus second quarter 2019. The increase in adjusted cruise costs without fuel per ALBD is driven by essentially five things. First, the cost of a portion of the fleet being in pause status. Second, restart-related expenses for 20 ships. Third, 24 ships being in dry dock during the quarter, which resulted in over double the number of dry dock days during the second quarter versus the second quarter 2019. Fourth, the cost of maintaining enhanced health and safety protocols, and finally, inflation. Remember that because a portion of the fleet was in pause status during the second quarter and the higher number of dry dock days, we spread costs over less ALBD. The first half of 2022 had an unusually large number of ships in dry dock as part of our resumption of cruising ramp-up optimizing our dry dock schedule while the ships are not in service, and ensuring that the ships look great and work great when they welcome their first guest back on board. However, the second half 2022 dry dock schedule looks more normal by historical standards. We anticipate that many of these costs and expenses, driving adjusted cruise costs without fuel per ALDD higher, will end during 2022 and will not reoccur in 2023. As a result of all of the above, we expect to see a significant improvement in adjusted cruise costs excluding fuel per ALBD from the first half of 2022 to the second half of 2022, with a mid-teens increase expected for the full year 2022 compared to 2019. Next, I'll provide a summary of our second quarter cash flows. We ended the second quarter 2022 with $7.5 billion in liquidity versus $7.2 billion at the end of the first quarter. The change in liquidity during the quarter was driven essentially by six things. First, negative adjusted EBITDA of approximately $900 million due to our ongoing resumption of guest cruise operations and improvement from the first quarter. Second, our investment of $500 million in capital expenditures. Third, $200 million of debt principal payments. And fourth, $400 million of interest expense during the quarter, all of which was more than offset by a $1.4 billion increase in customer deposits during the quarter, along with the billion-dollar principal amount of senior unsecured notes we issued last month. Now I will touch on our 2024 mandatory order to rotation. I wanted to take a moment to explain our situation as it is very different from most publicly listed companies outside the UK and the EU. Carnival PLC, our UK publicly listed company, which is part of our dual listed company structure, is subject to UK law, which requires mandatory order to rotation. Therefore, 
Price Waterhouse Coopers, or PWC as they are more commonly called, must be changed as Carnival PLC's audit us for the fiscal 2024 audit at the latest. Therefore, we conducted a competitive RFP process for the independent audit of Carnival PLC, as well as the consolidated entity, Carnival Corporation and PLC. As a result of the recently completed RFP process, yesterday, our board of directors appointed Deloitte as the company's independent auditor for fiscal 2024. We completed the RFP process in the first half of 2022 to ensure an orderly transition of non-audit services for the remainder of 2022 and to ensure independence by Deloitte in 2023 as required under UK law. Before I continue, I would like to add that the Board of Directors and Management of Carnival Corporation and PLC would like to thank PricewaterhouseCoopers for its continued service as the company's independent auditor. Now let's look at booking trends. The higher March weekly booking volumes we talked about on our last business update continue throughout the quarter. This resulted in booking volumes for all future sailings during the second quarter 2022 being nearly double the booking volumes during the first quarter 2022. Second quarter 2022 booking volumes for all future sailings were the best quarterly booking volumes we have seen since the beginning of the pandemic, although they were still below the 2019 level. I am happy to report that booking volumes since the beginning of April for the second half of 2022 sailing have been higher than 2019 level. All of this reflects the previously expected extended wait season. And as I said before, we were very encouraged by the close-in demand we experienced during the second quarter for the second quarter, resulting in nearly double the close-in occupancy gain in second quarter 2022 versus second quarter 2019, a trend we had anticipated. While the cumulative book position for the second half of 2022 is below the historical range, we believe we are well situated with our current second half 2022 book position given current booking volumes, coupled with closer in booking patterns. We continue to expect that occupancy will build throughout 2022 and return to historical levels in 2023. Pricing on our cumulative book position for the second half of 2022 is lower with or without FCC normalized for bundle packages as compared to 2019 sales. For the full year 2023, our cumulative advanced book position continues to be at the higher end of the historical range and at higher prices with or without FCCs normalized for bundled packages as compared to 2019 sailing. This is a great achievement given pricing on bookings for 2019 sailings is a tough comparison as that was a high water mark for historical yields. During the second quarter 2022, we once again increased our advertising expense compared to the first quarter 2022 in anticipation of our full fleet being in guest cruise operations and our 8% capacity increase for 2023 versus 2019. Second quarter 2022 is the first time since the pandemic that advertising expense was above 2019 levels. I will finish up with our adjusted EBITDA expectations and our current financial position. We all know that booking trends are a leading indicator of the health of our business. With improved recent booking trends leading the way, driving customer deposits higher, positive adjusted EBITDA is clearly within our sight. Adjusted EBITDA over the first half of 2022 was impacted by restart-related spending and dry dock expenses as 34 ships, nearly 40% of our fleet, were in dry dock during the first half of fiscal 2022. For the third quarter, with over 90% of our capacity back in guest cruise operations and occupancy percentages building, we expect ship-level cash contribution to grow. As a result, 
we expect adjusted EBITDA to be positive for the third quarter 2022, which, after everything we've been through, will be something worth celebrating. With EBITDA turning positive, more liquidity than last quarter, debt maturity towers that have been well managed through 2024, we have already refinanced a portion of our 2023 maturities, and we will do the rest over time. And now I will turn the call back over to Arnold. Thank you, David. Operator, please open the call to questions. Thank you. To queue up for a question, please press the 1, followed by the 4 on your telephone. You will hear a 3 tone prompt acknowledge request. One moment, please, for the first question. Our first question comes from the line of Steve Wisinski with uh, Steve. Will, please go ahead. Yeah, hey, guys. Good morning. Um, Arnold, congratulations, and it was, uh, it was a great run. So thanks for your, uh, for your service. Hey, um, so, so first question would be around the, the, the booking patterns, which, you know, clearly here are continuing to strengthen. Um, you know, however, I guess investors are going to, you know, at this point, based on where your stock is, they're going to look past booking, current booking patterns, and, you know, they're going to focus on what could come next given an uncertain macro backdrop. And I guess my question is, you know, how would you guys, uh, you know, attack a slowdown in bookings, um, you know, or load factors? In the past, you would have typically cut prices in order to keep load factors, uh, you know, high. But this time around, you know, if you do see booking slow, do you think you guys and your peers would be able to stay more disciplined on the pricing side of things so the recovery wouldn't be as steep on the other side? A couple of quick comments. First of all, I um, wouldn't comment on what the others would do. Um, you, you can talk to them directly. Um, for us, you know, we have, as we've um, been hit with different variants and invasion of Ukraine and other things um, and bringing more capacity on board, you know, we, we've had to consider all of that. And at this point in time, you know, largely we have done everything in mind of trying to keep our pricing strong, you know, going forward um, because we think that's, that's the right move right now. Uh, the positive thing here is that there is pent-up demand. And so even if there was a global recession, um, the reality is we are, as I said in my comments, uh, recession resilient historically and this time if there was a recession there's tremendous pent-up demand which in the past wasn't necessarily the case because it's been a couple of years where people have not uh, been able you know to travel the way they wanted to so um, uh, combination of things one is you know we are naturally somewhat recession resilient we have an added tailwind of pent-up demand and yes we're focused on um, doing what we can to ultimately drive the cash we need, but at the same time, do in a manner where you know we can uh, maintain um, pricing strength. Uh, David, may so, have a comment? Yeah, just, just one thing I'd add to that. You know, remember, Steve, not every recession is the same, and we are currently in a very strong labor market. And given that, you know, if people have jobs and they feel comfortable in their jobs, they're likely, you know, to need a vacation. And remember, vacations are no longer a luxury. They're a necessity in today's world. So I, I think we will do very well. As, as Arnold said, he, you know, we are recession resilient and we'll do very well in a recessionary environment. And then there's, you know, we'll see if a recession comes right now. You know, savings are really high. As David pointed out, employment rates are, you know, really low. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's um, economic strength for the time being. But so we'll see what happens. Okay, gotcha. Thanks for that, guys. And then, and then, second question, I guess probably for you, David. Uh, you know, around the the recent debt raise, and we we got a lot of questions from investors about you know why you guys would would go out and raise debt north of uh, you know ten percent, and maybe what drove you, uh, or you know maybe there was an underlying underlying reason, you know, as to why you had to raise debt at those levels. And I guess from here, you know, the question is going to be, you know, what is the opportunity moving forward to you know to refinance, or maybe there there isn't a chance to refinance, um, you know, given where rates are at this point. Yeah. So, you know, if you, um, as I said on the last conference call, we were looking to over time refinance the $3 billion of 2023 maturities. And we were focused on that. 
And, you know, we took a look and we believe that we're in a rising interest rate environment. And so we did go out and we raised a billion dollars at 10 and a half percent. It was a difficult day in the market. Nobody could have predicted the, what would happen in the overall market. But what's interesting is despite the market backdrop, we were able to raise the billion dollars uh, within the price talk uh, that we wanted on that day. And we felt very good about that. Um, we're looking to do $2 billion to refinance, you know, the remaining portion, as I said in my um, notes, over time. But, you know, we're just averaging in. Um, if you look at it today, you know, interest rates are higher than they were a month or so ago when we, we actually did our um, bond offering. So, you know, I'd say that we were in a good position. We feel good about what we did. And we'll look to refinance the other $2 billion over the, um, the ensuing months ahead. And we're just averaging in. You know, keep in mind, despite, I will say, adding 10.5%, if you look at our portfolio of debt, our average interest rate today is 4.5%. So we've done a great job managing the whole portfolio. And, and you know, this is just one minor piece in the portfolio. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. Best of luck, Arnold. Thanks, Steve. Next question from the line of Robin Farley, UBS. Please go ahead. Great. Um, thank you. Um, Arnold, best wishes since this is the last earnings call. You'll, you'll be joining us for um, good luck with everything. Thanks, um, Rob. I, I had a question. Um, uh, on occupancy, you know, I think investors kind of struggle with, you know, how much of the lower occupancy is sort of temporary, like the Omicron cancellations in, in Q1 and new ships going into service at, at lower levels, and, and how much, in other words, to try to kind of see the, the pent-up demand there. I, I wonder if you could give us a little bit of color on sort of the sequential build in occupancy through Q2. I, I know you normally wouldn't give that level of detail, you know, and or um, maybe something with your visibility on Q3, which I think, you know, normally you would be, you know, 80 to 90 percent booked by now and just kind of, you know, are you seeing um, for, for ticket price relative to 19 and occupancy, you know, with that level of visibility? I don't know if you comment a little more specifically. Thanks. Yeah, you bet, Roman. I'll, I'll have David share some details, but um, the overarching comment would be that, you know, we, we have um, real strength in occupancy, and we have some intentionally constrained occupancy as we brought ships on back online um, because of protocols in different places and so on. Um, we also had some isolated situations where we were moving, you know, um, crew around temporarily as uh, we were staffing up with, with crew and, and uh, constrained capacity. Um, for that, for those reasons as well, but overall our, uh, our occupancy, but our occupancy rates have, as we share it, have have um, really improved over time here. And and as we mentioned, the Carnival brand is looking at 110 percent occupancy uh, in the third quarter. So we have more capacity sailing, and occupancy is rising nicely. And as the world. Um, you know, continues to relax and become comfortable managing the virus um, and restrictions are relaxed. Um, you know, we see things moving more the direction of the Carnival brand where things are more normalized, even though they still have some restrictions right now. Uh, David? Yeah, so, so during the, the second quarter, I mean, the variance between the months, it, it went from 67 to 71 percent, which is why we wound up overall with that 69% occupancy for the quarter. Um, so, and, and as Arnold said, we're eight, you know, approaching 80% for the month of June. Um, and with booking trends good, we, we continue to build. So, but keep in mind that as um, I had indicated, we started 20 ships in the second quarter. And of course, there were a number of cruises where early on we constrained occupancy to ensure we practice and the guests have a great time. Um, and so we build on those ships, and you can see the benefit of that when we got to June. Um, so we feel very good about the overall trend. It is positive, um, moving in the right direction, and we do expect to see an improving trend in the third quarter and, uh, you know, in, into 2023. Okay. Great, thank you. And just as a follow-up question um, on the expense um, commentary, 
you know, you put it. Uh, you, you mentioned a lot of sort of buckets about you know pause status, ship restart costs, dry dock, all of those, um, as being part of that 23% increase. And I know you mentioned that will improve significantly by year end. I wonder if you could quantify a, a little bit of um, how much of that increase was just in inflation and health and safety. In other words the other factors all being somewhat temporary, you know, the pause status, the restart cost, the dry dock, how much of those, you know, sort of 23 points are, um, go away um, automatically just by having your, the, the fleet back in service, um, just so we can think about kind of where you could get to by the end of the year in terms of expense per passenger cruise day. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think the best way to, um, for you to, you can do your own quantification and it's pretty easy. If you think about, we were sort of 24% up per ALBD for the first half. And all you have to do is if you're mid-teens for the full year, you come back into where we were for the second half, taking out the pause status, the restart, the dry docks. Because I did say that the dry docks in the back half of the year um, were going to be sort of more normal-like in terms of the number of dry dock days. So if you're back into the number you'll be able to see where we are for the back half of the year, which is a better reflection overall than, you know, the first half. Now, there's still noise in that because of supply chain disruption and other things, and we are working really hard to manage that down, and, and we will do that. So, but, but that's probably the best way to, to back into it. And I know that that simple average would would get you to kind of a mid single digit for um, for the second half. But I I guess I was wondering by kind of the end of the year, really thinking about 2023. Um, that's why I was looking for sort of what what pieces would you know maybe go I, to, to zero. I understand, and and you know I'm not in a position to give cost guidance for 2023 at this point. Um, but I was just trying to give you some directional. You can see what the back half is and we'll manage through um, all of those items effectively over the next six months. And, you know, like I always say, we hope to do better. Um, but at, at this point, it would be um, premature for me to give you cost guidance. Okay. Understood. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Rob. Our next question comes from the line of Jamie Katz with Morningstar. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning, and thanks for taking my question. I'm, um, I'd be interested in hearing um, how you guys are seeing differences between domestic and international consumers, particularly because of uh, this transition um, of Costa ships, maybe being, you know, this, this rebranding with Carnival and, and whether or not that's signaling anything. Yeah, I think just generally, um, obviously, uh, Europe, in many ways is um, uh, more challenged from consumer demand um, standpoint as it relates to travel um, uh, to an extent to North America. And what you're seeing in the move with um, uh, Costa by Carnival and uh, uh, transfer of the Luminosa in Australia to Carnival is uh, part of a right-sizing of Costa for what we see as a European environment, which is complicated not only by COVID and um, macroeconomic conditions somewhat triggered by the uh, invasion of Ukraine, but also, you know, the invasion of Ukraine. And so all of those things are impacting uh, the European uh, market sector. Uh, so we're reallocating to, uh, uh, to, you know, brands that have stronger demand, they're in a stronger position. Uh, that's one of the beautiful things. Our assets are mobile. Uh, so, but overall, we still see strong demand in Europe. And uh, there are portions of Europe, um, the, the UK in particular, and um, uh, also um, uh, we see some um, continuing strength in, in portions of Germany and, and what have you. And so, um, so we see a good market in Europe, a strong market in North America, and um, and we're just reallocating across the brands to optimize our portfolio and and maximize um, the cash generation and position us for the long term. If I can, if I can build on that um, a little bit, I, I did want to point out. So, you know, we talked about our uh, bookings in the second quarter nearly doubling um, the um, uh, what they were in the first quarter. So, 
the, the NAA brands were a little bit over double and the EA brands, um, which includes um, Costco, were a little bit less than double. Both, I mean, everything is heading in the right direction. There was good, solid, strong demand in, in all the brands, but the NAA brands are doing, you know, from a booking trend perspective, a little bit better than the EA brands. I, I'd also like to point out, you know, add to uh, Arnold's comments about um, Costa by Carnival, because keep in mind, you know, a big chunk of Car uh, Costa's capacity in 2019 was in China. And so with that market at the moment closed, um, we, rather than take all of that capacity and put it in Europe, we created a new market for the Carnival guests, which we think will expand the market here in um, North America and will be in a much better position overall. So we feel very good about all of our brands and, and the direction, and we are managing it appropriately, as you could see, with, that what Arnold talked about, the moves of the ships. Okay. And then, David, I don't think it was explicitly um, noted, but in the past, I think you guys had pointed to, to 2023 EBITDA above 2019 levels. Um, and are, do you still feel like uh, the business is tracking in the right direction to achieve that? So I've, I've said that quite a number of times. Um, I think we are – have the, I, what I've always said is we have the potential for EBITDA to be greater in 2023 than 2019. Um, it, you know, the one big wild card, of course, is the price of fuel, um, which has risen um, quite a bit in the last few months. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, but there is, with the occupancy improving over time, there certainly is that potential. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Patrick Scholes with Truist. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, Arnold, uh, best wishes as uh, well. Thank you, Patrick. Um, thank you. Um, can, uh, two quite Well, first question is, can you comment on your uh, potential willingness to sell brands to uh, one or more brands to help shore up the balance sheet? Well, we're um, – very pleased with our portfolio of brands. Um, you know, having said that, you know, our job is always to keep an open mind and do what's best for the shareholders. And so, um, you know, uh, we would absolutely, um, again, evaluate any and all options. But we're only going to do what makes sense for the shareholders, given our projections of opportunity, you know, given the portfolio we have. Okay. Uh, fair enough. And then uh, my second question is a bit of a clarification on uh, some of the text in the earnings release where uh, you noted that uh, cumulative advanced bookings for the second half of 22 are uh, now below the historical range, which uh, implies it's obviously it was uh, uh, lowered from the previous where you said it was at lower end. You, specifically, you noted here this position is consistent with its expected improving occupancy levels for the second half of 22. Can you explain a little bit more what that what that last phrase means there. I'm not quite understanding what you mean by consistent with expected improving occupancy levels. Yeah, so what we were trying to say, yeah, what we're just trying to say there um, is, you know, like Arnold indicated that in the month of um, June, in his prepared remarks, he said occupancy was uh, approaching 80%. And so what we were trying to say is despite the fact that we were below the historical range, um, we do expect because of the closer in nature of the booking patterns to see occupancy in the back half of 2022 uh, to be higher than the 69% in the second quarter. And, and that's all we were really trying to indicate to people uh, with that statement. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you for the clarification. Sure. Thank you, Beth. Next question from the line of James Hardiman with City. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning. Um, thanks good morning. for taking my questions. And, and Arnold, I, I wanted to 
reiterate congratulations and uh, and good luck with with what's next. Um, Thanks. Wanted to um, hone in a little bit on um, some of the pricing commentary, particularly the the revenue per passenger cruise day. Um, I think you said that number was down a little bit. There was some a little bit of an FCC uh, headwind there, um, but I think I think that same number was up north of seven seven percent in the in the last quarter. Um, obviously, there's this growing concern that that the industry is is going to um, need to to push price a little bit to fill these ships. Uh, maybe speak to that idea as we continue to fill up the ships in the third quarter and beyond. Uh, should we expect that pricing number uh, to go down down further? And then obviously we're going to get back some of that that FCC impact. But sort of excluding that piece, um, how should we think about revenue per passenger cruise day as we continue to to raise occupancy? So, okay, um, I, I think overall, you know, Arnold in his notes talked about the fact that we were. Uh, focused on maximizing occupancy while preserving uh, price in the long term. And and so we are very keen on that. Um, You know, we did increase advertising expense in the second quarter for that purpose uh, to create more demand. We are seeing more first-timers. We had mentioned the fact that we saw a significant improvement in first-timers. So what we're trying to do here is we're – you know, building towards historical occupancy levels in 2023 with better pricing. As we indicated, the pricing for 2023 is up. But with the shorter booking window and the use of um, opaque channels and the use of limited promotions, um, we are driving occupancy in the short term uh, in order to optimize the EBITDA and the cash flow from operations of the business. So while you know I'm not um, prepared to give you guidance on the third and fourth quarter revenue, gross revenue per PCD, um, which by the way, if you just think about the third quarter, one of the things to remember is we hope to have a lot of kids on board in the third quarter. And those thirds and fourths will also generally, um, they add to the revenue, they add to the bottom line, but they will also, on a per PCD basis, be lower than the lower berths, uh, both for the ticket and the onboard. The kids don't generally spend as much on board either, but we're happy to have them all on board. So there are factors in there that you have to consider as you think about the, you know, the trend per PCD uh, from third to fourth quarter and beyond. And with the increase in occupancy that we experienced in the second quarter, even with the, also the capacity increase we had in the second quarter, um, when you normalize for FCCs, you know, um, our pricing did not decline. That's that's really helpful, color, and 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 maybe you already answered this to some degree, but if I if I sort of zoom out here for a minute, historically the industry has has largely used this you know, price to, to fill paradigm. Um, and I think with some of these metrics, um, the concern is that we'll return to that. We were, you know, pre-pandemic, we were, it seemed like in a better place, you know, thinking more about long-term pricing opportunities. Um, maybe speak to if there's been any change in, in your philosophy pre-pandemic to, to now, um, just given the importance of, you know, filling up these ships and and getting to to positive free cash flow. So, you know, one of the things that you have to think about in all of this is over time, we are already seeing it, um, but we, the protocol friction is reducing. Um, You know, just recently they dropped, the U.S. dropped the testing requirements for people to get back into the U.S. from um, international uh, places. And we are seeing, we are uh, starting to, to see the ability for us to reduce our protocols and reduce the frictions. And I think that will bring back people from the sidelines and will create additional demand, which, which will allow us to get better occupancy um, at a better price. Uh, so directionally, 
um, with more first timers coming on board and the reduced protocols, we feel very good about the, the future um, over the next few quarters in 2023. And keep in mind as you as you track all of this that uh, that there are mixed issues in here too. You know, just portfolio mix and you know um, overall brand positioning as well as specific itinerary uh, itineraries available and what have you. So the average price is there's a lot of noise in that, and uh, and the overall you know the message we're sending and what we are experiencing is an encouragement of a, a strong market coming back, pent up demand, um, and, and us carefully managing that, uh, thoughtfully managing it as we, you know, create the cash um, and at the same time position the business well for the future. That's a really helpful color. Thank you both. Thank you. Next question from the line of Dan Pulitzer, Wells Fargo, please go ahead. Hey, good morning, everyone, and, and Arnold, best of luck, and, and Josh, congratulations on the new position. Um, so I had a question on, on customer deposits and how we should think about this for the rest of the year. Obviously, it was very strong in the second quarter. I mean, there's typically a decline sequentially. Um, so, you know, just as we think about cash flow through, for the rest of the year and how, you know, customer deposits flow through, is it is it safe to say that, you know, they, the third quarter should be you know, is not going to be cash flow positive or, you know, just given that there's that sequential decline or given the extent that you guys continue to recover in terms of your bookings and operations, the third quarter could continue to be cash flow positive? So that's a great question. And we've been um, trying to, to answer that. I, I will tell you that in the last, since the end of uh, May, uh, customer deposits have continued to increase. They're up a few hundred million dollars. Um, so that, that at least directionally in, in um, the last, uh, what has it been, uh, three and a half weeks, that's where we're at. We're at. Um, normally during the third quarter, there is a reduction because we reach the seasonal high peak at the end of May. Um, but there are offsetting factors this year that, you know, we would expect to see. With uh, more ships coming back online and higher occupancies, that should mitigate um, any normal seasonalization. Whether it completely mitigates it or not, it's um, very hard for me to predict at this point. Um, but there are some mitigating factors to the normal seasonalization of customer deposits. Got it. Go ahead. Go, go right ahead. Oh, so yeah. One. One more quick one, if I could just squeeze it in, um, you know, and just the newer cruise product, a lot of your fleet has been has been refreshed. To what extent have you been able to capture that pricing? You know, typically these, the newer product gets a, a premium price, um, but this is kind of a, a weird environment. Have you been able to capture that? Uh, and if so, any kind of metrics or, or, you know, way to quantify that? Yeah, <laughs> it's very hard to tell. Yeah. I mean, we look at so many things, but um, there's so many variables. So many right variables now. right now. It is just very, very difficult to tell. Um, you know, in the comparison going back to um, 2019. So we, we look at the total. We manage it appropriately. I will tell you, those new ships are performing very well. Um, high levels of occupancy, generating significant cash flows. And as we, you know, move forward, um, I suspect that we will be able to continue to, to generate a, a premium there. Um, Arnold indicated, you know, nearly um, a quarter of our fleet will be new in 2023 or newly delivered. Um, the average age of our fleet, believe it or not, I think I've said this before maybe on one of the previous calls, but from 2019 to 2023, despite the passage of four years, the average age of our fleet went down one year. Um, so that, that we've got a lot of new capacity, which should help very well, uh, both on the revenue side and on the cost side from an efficiency perspective and better fuel consumption. So we are very excited about the future and, and delivering memorable vacation experiences to probably 14 million people in 2023 as we go for, um, you know, historical occupancy levels. Operator, we'll take um, one more question. Uh, let's make it a good one for Josh. Go ahead. 
Our next uh, question comes from the line of Asia Georgieva, Infinity Research. Please go ahead. Um, good morning, Arnold. Uh, you'll be missed, but Josh, um, very happy that you received this uh, great position responsibility and uh, triple promotion. So I do have a good question for you, hopefully. Um, with uh, the cost by carnival uh, concept, uh, that is obviously something that would be a long-term fixture. We're not just uh, moving ships around uh, for you know the next uh, two or three years. Um, do you believe that this is something that could be expanded? And does the cost of fuel uh, play any role in terms of what ships might actually uh, continue to join the new concept? LNG deliveries have been uh, somewhat difficult, I guess, in Europe. Um, we had issues with cost in South America last winter season. So uh, how do you see the development of the concept and what are the key parameters that would actually play into it? I'm going to have Josh come in on the, the overall um, brand position and stuff as, as we go forward. But real quickly on the LNG fuel question. Um, uh, LNG, as you know, is the cleanest burning um, fossil fuel. It gives us a 20% uh, reduction in carbon emissions, et cetera. Um, but the shifts you know, are dual, so they can also burn MGO. And so that unto itself wouldn't impact the future of the cost of brand. Um, you know, we'll um, burn LNG whenever it makes sense and, and to do so, which we think will be the majority of the life of the ships. Um, but there are times when we'll obviously opt to uh, uh, burn MGO. But in terms of the um, Carnival by Costa positioning, um, it's a new concept, and I'll let Josh share his thoughts about it. Go ahead, Josh. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Thank you, just one thing to clarify. Obviously, the, the two ships that we're talking about that are that are going under this uh, Costa by Carnival umbrella are not LNG uh, ships, so that, that obviously didn't enter into our mindset at all. So uh, just to reiterate right. Arnold's point. So with respect to the, to the positioning, you know, I think this is a great example of leveraging the scale of this corporation. Because what we could have done is, is taken those ships, new beautiful ships, solely under the Costa name and tried to introduce them into the North American market uh, on a standalone basis. But this is actually the opportunity to leverage everything that Carnival does so well here in the United States and Canada for its guest base. So by marrying that along with Costa's you know, beautiful tonnage um, and, and uh, onboard um, onboard experiences, we have the ability to marry that up and, and make a best go of, of creating something really special. So the short answer is we absolutely expect this to be successful and we don't look at this as something short term, but ideally it'll be something that works and we can build upon. Okay, so currently uh, no further plans. Obviously you've made plans for 2023 and 2024, so that's uh, plenty of uh, uh, time and capacity coming in, the two ships. So at this point, it's too early to discuss whether this would become sort of a mini brand on its own. Yeah, I think let's let's try it out with two ships, and then we'll then we'll see how we do. But uh, that that's it for now. So Makes thank sense. you, everyone. Thank you. Really. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Really appreciate it, um, uh, and uh, looking forward uh, to uh, listening to these as we go forward and um, hearing the great news um, coming from Josh and our team. So thank you all very much, and, and have a great day. That concludes today's call. We thank you for your participation and ask you to please disconnect your lines.